Dear Lord, we thank you for this time that we could come together to study your word. And as we get into it, we just uh, thank you for your, your presence among us. We thank you for the wisdom and the knowledge and understanding uh, that you give us from on high. So lead us into all truths, all understanding for, uh, you know, satisfy and nourish us uh, with what we need uh, today. So we thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Oh, and also, I uh, just want to continue to lift uh, Brother Jim up as he continues to uh, present his, present his final, final night at Depression and Recovery. So bless him. In your name we ask. Amen. 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 All righty. Amen. So Hebrews 4 has 16 verses. Chapter 4. And it says, Let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Verse 3. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest although the words were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Verse 5. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, Verse 7. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, if you will hear my voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his work as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fail after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of souls and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Verse 15. For if we have not an high priest which cannot, cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, there were a chapter, you know, chapter three had started with that. Wherefore, holy brethren, you know, and encourage them to be partakers of the heavenly calling and to consider, consider Jesus, the high priest in the apostle of our profession. And, and chapter four kind of ends the same way. Well, there's a lot more discussion in the hardening of heart in chapter three, but you see more of this this call to enter into his rest and and why we don't or the reasons that we don't. I know we did dwelt a, a, a lot on this, you know, on at least on the Sabbath school when we talked about about entering about entering into his rest. What does that really mean? What does entering rest really mean to people? Yeah. What are we resting? What are we resting from? Earning yeah. our salvation. Well, we we connect this passage with with the Sabbath rest, which was mm -hmm. ceasing from our works. Mm. That's what Sabbath rest was: is no longer doing my works, stopping my works, and, and all of our works are, are sin, <laughs> are evil, because of the intents of our heart, all of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And instead, we enter into his rest by what were the only works that were permitted on the Sabbath? It was only the works of God <laughs> mm -hmm. were permitted mm -hmm. on the Sabbath. 
uh, when we, you know, when we do his works and we cease from our works, then we've entered into his rest. Mm. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a neat point, especially when you consider when, you know, in Revelation, I think we touched on this last week too, when they, they have no rest day or night who worship, who worship the beast. So really when we start to think in our own way and our own thoughts, we're really functioning beastly. And, and for a lot of people, that's hard to, that's hard to accept. Hey, wait, wait a minute. I'm an all right person. I do these good things. What? What do you mean? What do you mean I'm doing that when I think my own thoughts? I'm really acting beastly. What is that? I mean, when it says in verse 11 to, uh, that we are to labor to enter into the rest. <laughs> so obviously there's still some labor being done in, as part of this yeah. rest. That's the works of God, which really aren't our works. That's him working in us. And, and then verse 12 almost seems out of place if you don't understand rest properly. Like why, why does it matter that God knows my thoughts? <laughs> but if the whole issue is ceasing from my evil thoughts and behaviors and entering into the rest of God's thoughts and behavior, then the fact that he can discern everything, you know, makes perfect sense. Amen. What is it in us? I mean, what is it in us, you know, when we, you know, that, that we don't want to really, because that, you know, it's one of those statements that if you look at it on the surface, it seems like kind of an oxymoron. Let us labor to rest. What does that, you know, mm -hmm. what does that mean? But, uh, yeah, you know, I see that. Yeah. that that's the struggle with it. Right? Hmm. So the New King James says, be diligent to rest, to enter into rest. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. It means mean desire, too. It's desire. Amen. It has to be a... Uh, yeah, a lot of need in us. Um, I was looking at um, verse 1, and it says that there's a promise. That's it. The promise remains of entering his rest. So, it's a gift. Mm. Amen. And what is what is the promise? The promise is that he's going to give us enmity between us and ourselves, right? Us and our sinful nature. Or uh, I don't know if that came out quite right. <clears throat> but enmity between my seed and uh, and the, the the seed of uh, the Savior, right? Or well, the seed of the serpent, I mean. Hmm. So it's a gift. Well, that enmity to, yeah, is in, it is in us all. We do resist, you know. We do kind of like Paul, you know, we kick against the pricks, right? We do, we do resist. There's that, there's that battle that rages in us between the spiritual man and the fleshly within us. But he also sure. is talking, whoops. But um, so it's a promise, right? It's a gift. Mm. Um, so there's nothing we can do to actually receive it. <laughs> mm. Well, our, he do, it does. Our actions talk, don't don't uh, make it real. Uh, uh. right. It's it's it, it's his work, right? Because the promise is, is he will write his law on our hearts and on our minds. So he does the mm. work. But mm. what keeps what keeps people? Uh, I think you mentioned it earlier. Um, what keeps people from entering into that rest? Uh, yep. Is that evil heart of unbelief? Right. So defining what that unbelief is. Mm. <clears throat> and verse is verse it, two. Verse two kind of gives us a little a little peek into that, right? The word preached did not profit them. In other words, that you know the, the understanding they were receiving from from God wasn't profiting them because it wasn't mixed with faith. You have to have that that belief that that laying laying hold of that knowing that promise is real. 
And irregardless of what the externals okay. out there, or even what yourself is trying to tell yourself, you've got to lay hold on, on what God is, you know, that, that kind of that Jacob thing again, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Mm. Irregardless of the circumstances around us. How about, um, how about defining what the gospel is? Mm. What is the gospel? What is the good news? Is the gospel about me or is mm. the gospel about my understanding of the character of God? Mm. And that leads to trust and belief, or I use them all synonymously, faith. So once we believe the good news about the character of God, then we're more apt to trust him and walk in that belief that walk in that promise does that make any sense whatsoever you know i see i see a, a part of it too where it's god god is is he is the one who's pursuing us we tend to we tend to put ourselves in this search pattern to find god when it's god who's finding who's he's seeking us out and he's in the, and it, it, like it says it it he draws us um uh, what is it in corinthians doesn't tell us he compels us with his loving kindness you know his uh his kindness leads us to repentance right his you know yes what his grace does it's he's, it's the, the drawing power of god how he draws us to the cross is his character or the manifestation mm -hmm. of his character through christ or you know we read where he says that god loves us right mm -hmm. that is what draws us into a trusting relationship with him we're not afraid of him anymore because he's going to punish us if we don't obey mm. so there's a what i'm saying is traditionally um i've been um keeping the sabbath because i have to mm. but understanding the character of god makes me want to because i want to understand more about him i want to set aside that time so i can get to know him better and experience that rest that he's promised so i'm saying it's it's the transformation of my understanding of his character that draws me closer to him and allows him to do that work <clears throat> because if i'm afraid of somebody I'm not going to trust him. And I'm really not going to want to get to know him. Hmm. Romans 1, 16 defines the gospel as the power of God unto salvation to everyone mm. that believes. Mm -hmm. wow. It's the gospel that was preached unto them. Amen. But you have to believe. And, you, and, and so... You know, any any thought that is outside of belief <laughs> in salvation in Jesus Christ is from my evil heart of unbelief and takes me away from his rest. So could you use the word trust in place of that word belief? Yeah, you can use faith as well. I mean, anything exactly. that's not of faith is sin. There's no rest in sin. Sin is enmity between us and God, not us and yeah. the serpent. So what yeah. I'm saying is it's about the understanding. Um, you, I, you, you can know, add I, the trust. With, with trust, you can't. If you, if you don't trust somebody, how can you love them? Hmm. Exactly. And you really love somebody who you don't trust? No. And, and if the law is based on love and his character is a character of love and he is love, then if I don't trust him, I can't love him and then I can't obey him. Exactly. And if you love me, keep my commandments. Right. So, mm -hmm. so if I believe in my heart that he's going to torture me for as long as it as i deserve because i disobeyed or because i forgot to ask for forgiveness for something i did 
then that's going to break down that love relationship. But isn't it, but isn't an aspect of, of us is is understanding our our true condition, understanding what we're deserving of, but but yet seeing Christ as as the one who who laid down his life for us. He's the one who laid his life down for me. He's he took the penalty of, of what I deserve, of what I truly what I truly deserve. So I guess what he is does, it? Yeah. What is it? I'm I, sorry. No, no. Uh, but I, I I just, you know, I I see my true condition, but I know God doesn't want to leave me in that condition. He wants to raise me up out of it. So the question that I ask myself is, um, what is it that I deserve hmm. as yeah. his as his creation, as his child, and his son, God, being the great physician? What is it that I deserve? Do I deserve being born in sin and conceived in iniquity, not making a conscious decision for doing that, but being born into this condition? What is it that I deserve? What was that? We, we deserve death. Without Christ, we cannot do any good thing. See, this is what I'm. This is what I'm contending with. This is why I'm asking these questions, because if I'm your son and I'm sick, you're going to do anything that you possibly can to heal me. The statement I believe that David makes that we are born in sin and conceived in iniquity is that I am born with a condition. I'm born with a sickness and that he came to heal that sickness, mm -hmm. not to threaten to punish me if I don't obey, mm -hmm. but to bring me um, a cure to, to heal that. And I, and I think that that gives us a whole different picture of what we deserve and i see i don't believe that that word is is appropriate at all because i believe that every one of god's creatures is his child Amen. and he came to heal that and to give us the choice whether to accept that cure that remedy or not and if we don't um, choose to take that remedy, then when we come into his presence, we will want to, because we don't trust him, we will want, we will be afraid and we will want to be hidden from the face of him who comes in the clouds. As it mm -hmm. says in, well, we'll want the rocks to fall on us and the mountains to fall on us. <clears throat> because we haven't learned that he is a God of love and all he wants to do is heal us. So as far as deserve goes, I don't believe that that's appropriate at all because what we deserve as his child is whatever he offers to give us for a remedy, but we have to choose to take that remedy. Well, and, and Brian, the remedy is for our true condition that we're born into, born into sin, is to be born again. That's the point mm -hmm. of being born again. That's right. Um, that's what he We that's need to what be born means. of God. Um, you know, where Nicodemus says, well, how can I enter back into my mother? You know, we all have had, most of us have had children, and we see our traits in the children, sometimes mm -hmm. our selfish traits. Third and fourth and generation. You know, yeah. what they need is the same thing that we need. They've inherited from us those traits. Mm -hmm. they, need, right. they need new parent, a new parent. They need to be born of God. Um, they need a transformation in their character. And that's only with conversion that that happens. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be a daily. I die daily. Yeah. yeah. No, I... 
I think also can't, can't, can't agree with you more. Um, that's exactly. Um, but like was being said earlier, you know, it's not our work, right? We have to partake of the blood and the flesh. That my, what does it say? My flesh is, is meat and my blood is um, true drink. So we have to partake of that in order to be um, born again. And that, and he is, he's the, he's the exemplification of that, of the, he is the remedy, right? That's why he came. Right. He overcame sin in order to give us his flesh and to give us his blood so that we would have that choice. And so he is right. absolutely, he's the remedy. Clarify, you're not speaking of the Eucharist. You're not speaking of communion, which is just a symbol. You're speaking of, you know, the true Christ, allowing Christ in you, the hope of glory, having mm -hmm. a, a transformation of our character with his character, the in Christ motif idea is what we need. Um, well, that's what true communion with God is. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's also, you know, I, I think of it less as what I deserve. I don't like to focus too much on what I deserve mm -hmm. um, but it's more that God as a creator who claims perfect righteousness and who claims to have been is responsible for all of the the, the conditions of creation and to also even to have foreseen that it could go wrong, even though he made it right to start with. Mm -hmm. Righteousness demands that he provide a solution or he shouldn't have created it at all. Mm -hmm. if he saw that it was going to go wrong, but he didn't have a solution. If he's really perfectly righteous, he should have just never created. And I'm sure he would have not created, but he did foresee a solution mm -hmm. and he provides the solution, the remedy, as we've said. And it's himself. It's the gift of himself and the Amen. union between divinity mm -hmm. with humanity to restore us, to heal us, as you said, to provide, you know, you know, any need or desire that God actually created. We have, we have plenty of selfish ones that are twisted, but we mm -hmm. actually have real needs and desires that are good that God created and. Mm -hmm. You know, righteousness, again, demands that he provide for those. Or else, why did you create the need? <laughs> you know, Amen. so. Amen. And he promises to do that, just to, to provide for the heart longing, not just the longing of the body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is right. Mm -hmm. By design. Yeah, he's a lamb, lamb slain from the foundation. So he is <laughs> right. He, he was... Yeah, from the foundation. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, uh, the, the parallel to that um, verse 7, it says, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Uh, it's in the 95th Psalm. You know, and I like what goes, what goes with that in verse 7 of the 95th sign. I think this is, you know, to, to Brian's point as well, too. And, and, and it really it is our understanding of who God is. It says for, you know, the, the psalmist says here, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart, he's saying. So, so you know, the understanding of who God is to us. You know, is that realization, and, and you've got that in in front of you, and um, you know, so hear his voice, hard not your heart, because mm -hmm. he is there. You are, you are, you are, yeah, you are the sheep of his hand. You know, yeah, the voice is really important that we can hear that still small voice. Mm. That's part of having that covenant experience is hearing the voice of God. Mm. Um, in our heart, because it says, my sheep hear my voice. Amen. That's an intimacy, and, and that's a one-on-one -on -one intimacy that, that, we can, that we can have with God, you know, and that however he manifests that relationship, 
is uh, I think it's to me that's the most amazing thing. And when you talk about you know that Deuteronomy chapter five verse five, that you know that that all of Israel could have gone up the mountain, but they they were afraid. Mm-hmm. You know, and I you just you just imagine that in your mind's eye with you know a million and a half or whatever it was people if they had done that you know the light that would have shown we see there in, in psalm 95 it also starts by pointing to all of you know attributes of him as creator yes amen amen which we just amen. talked about you know that amen. in yep. this you know he's a righteous king who created and Thus, he provided a solution or remedy to the foreseen problem, which is a revelation of his character. That's it's a revelation of what righteousness really is, because it was the it required the the ultimate sacrifice of mm. God Himself to provide that solution. Mm. And, and also, in pointing to Him as Creator, that's where we see the connection to the Sabbath, which is the memorial mm. of creation. That's the day the seventh day that remains mm-hmm. well when you read that verse four mm-hmm. for he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise and god did rest the seventh day from all his works so it's clearly bringing out you know the seventh day sabbath in relation to creation this is after the cross yeah. um paul is bringing this point out you know, yeah. I find that some of our evangelical friends are wanting to say that the Sabbath was done away with at the mm. cross with all the law, the rest of the law. I wonder, though, how they feel about, you know, would they want their husband uh, committing adultery? That's OK. It's, the law is done away with. No, it's only the <laughs> Sabbath that we're going to pick on. <laughs> it's the only Sabbath that we're uncomfortable with, at least in some circles. But you know, here we see it right here in the New Testament, um, bringing out this whole idea of resting righteousness by faith is resting in God, and it's clearly connected to the Seventh Day Sabbath mm. and Christ, God resting from His work. Mm. Amen. Amen. Undeniable. In Romans one that thought that. Talked about the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The very next verse is the just shall live by faith. Mm-hmm. Amen. You know, and it's important. You know, it's important too because a lot of a lot of people have this this sense that Christ died to appease appease his father, to appease an angry God, and that's not what that that was not what Jesus did. I mean, he yeah. laid down his life for his friends. Mm-hmm. And, just right. as Moses was willing to, to, you know, Moses being the example, was willing to do that, to, you know, for the people, to give his life for the people. He was that, that type of, of, of what Christ was going to do ultimately. Amen. Amen. Yeah, he had to provide that remedy, that overcoming yeah. to the Father so that the Father could give it to the Spirit to bring back to us so that we could be reborn. Mm. So it's it's really it's really a beautiful simple yet beautiful um, rendition of the of the plan of salvation versus paying the father um, his blood because we owed this debt. It's that's it's really really sick and pagan. And if you look at the character, mm-hmm. or you look at how Baal, the god Baal, and his father El functioned. That was exactly how they functioned. Mm -hmm. He needed to have a blood sacrifice to give to El to appease the angry God. And God is not angry. He's, 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 he's searching us out. He's appealing to us. But anyway, I wanted to just quickly get back to um, what you were saying about verse four and the God of creation, because I mean, it, the, his creation, if we look around, is always giving. Everything is dying and giving of itself for, so that something else could grow and live and survive. And that's, that's his character. He's always giving, always uh, uplifting, always holding together, giving of himself for the benefit of others. And that's what I love about 
you know, in Revelation, when it talks about we need to worship him who created, because that he, this is his character. It always goes back to his character. It's beautiful. And there was one other thing, and that was that, um, you know, throughout the days of creation, God was um, using immense amounts of power. Um, the example was shared that, yeah, you know, we take a few grams of matter and you can get a nuclear explosion from it. So the amount of energy that was put into creation is is so immense. I mean, we cannot even imagine it. And then he ceased from that to allow his creation to look at what he had created, um, you know, the trees and the plants and everything giving back to others and um and gives us an opportunity to rest and to think about what he has done and how he has mm -hmm. shown us who he is through his creation and i just just love these little these little lessons that he's he's trying to share with us about who he is and uh, who we are to him and what yeah. did the what did the rest involve but communing with his new creation, specifically with man, with Adam Amen. and Eve. That was what constituted rest, was direct communion with God mm -hmm. in his creation. Amen. That's how yes. they found rest together. Mm -hmm. right. Amen. And he could see he could see in man, as we as Psalm eight tells us, he could see, even though he could foresee all that was going to go wrong and what he would have to go through, through all of that he could see that this new creation would lead to an end of the rebellion and sin and so he <laughs> saw in god's mind there was rest in that seventh day as he saw the completed work of defeating rebellion in the hearts of his creation mm -hmm. and that brings rest to god man <laughs> from the war oh. that was going on in heaven Wow. Right. It was, it was proof. Uh, it was proof. Yeah. There's clearly a difference. I'm sorry. That um, it was... What was that, Julia? Well, I was just commenting on something that Brian had said earlier that how all of creation gives and that, and that is true. It, it represents God, but what we also see in creation though, is it nothing in creation gives without taking first. And the reason that that's important to understand is right. that everything we see is created. Only God gives without taking. Because mm. if you look at everything in creation, every plant, for example, it has to take from the sun. It has to take the rain. It has to take the elements before it can then give fruit. Okay, everything in nature mm -hmm. takes. That's the law of life before it gives. So that's mm -hmm. the difference between the created and the creator. We are the same. Amen. We have to take. We cannot give until we have taken. And we receive uh, from God. And then we're able to mm -hmm. give. But it's only, otherwise we would be, you know, we would be somewhat like God's, which is some people tend to think that you know some people out there tend to think that we are but mm -hmm. if you look at nature and you study it everything takes before they can give i, I like the word receive better uh, we yeah, receive. we receive we <laughs> receive before we can mm -hmm. give just like the rest of creation and we only can receive from god and, and the essence of life all life right requires water and light go figure Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because mm -hmm. oh, there's, God, there's nothing man. wrong with receiving. Amen. God designed us to re receive so that yeah. we could give. There are many creatures that choose to take beyond what they should receive. <laughs> and that's, that's mm -hmm. selfish. But receiving itself is God's design. Mm -hmm. and even before sin, that was the way that revealed that's God's right. character. Mm -hmm. Receiving and giving. Yeah. Amen. But, 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, it, it has it has to be that way, doesn't it? <laughs> it ha- we have to receive, and um, yeah. just appreciating Every- what we're where we're receiving it from. That's the key. And as Amen. we receive God's love, then we are able to share God's love with others. It's as we receive. Mm-hmm. That's the promise Amen. of entering into his rest. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. Amen. It's coming into harmony with the design and the designer. You know, I had this, um, I had this um, thought because there, there seems to be a, a lot of people. My, my daughter-in-law listens to, to some YouTube on these people now. They're Sunday keepers. And they've discovered the Sabbath in the Bible. And then they've decided that, well, on Saturday, on Sabbath, they're not going to do anything. They're going to rest because they say it's so busy because they participate in their worship services on Sunday and stuff. So they said, well, on Saturdays, we are just going to step away from the world and just. What do you all think is is right about that? But what do you think about that? Is is there anything wrong with with looking at the Sabbath as entering? you know, as, as entering into a rest. I mean, what's their, I guess maybe some of its motivation, but I was interested in your thoughts. I mean, it sounds like God is, is the spirit is drawing them to Mm -hmm. closer to the truth. But I mean, true rest is, you know, worship is part of true rest. (laughs) It should, it's not work. Any true worship is not our works it's god's works in me <laughs> which mm. isn't work and mm. all nature nature doesn't stop the operations of nature on sabbath it just can the natural operations the way god designed them are not work <laughs> they're they're the way god designed us to be i mean christ and the disciples were you know were quote, working all day, you know, healing people and preaching and, and very busy about ministry, and, and yet they weren't violating the Sabbath. You know, Jesus said, my father works hitherto and I work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, he reminded them how the, the priests work all, all Sabbath day and they're, they're blameless mm-hmm. because it's the work of God. Mm-hmm. So say that, you, you know, we're going to, just do nothing on Sabbath and then worship on Sunday. That's that's not that's not coming all the way to a, a true understanding of what Sabbath rest and worship really are. So Lori and I have had the opportunity to rub shoulders with Pastor Josh and his family, who's um, it's been a pastor here in South Royalton for probably four years or so, five. And he has, they have a lot of children and she homeschools the, the kids. And they were up here picking blueberries one one day and they were talking about Saturday and how they came across some, um, you know, radio broadcasts and TV about the Sabbath day. And that, that caught their interest. And they were sharing with us that because he's a pastor, he's very busy all day Sunday and experienced the same thing you were saying. Um, that they just it's not a rest for them on Sunday and so they they have taken Wednesday <laughs> as a kind of a midweek west rest and and that was kind of their um, they would do different more Christ activities at home during during their Wednesday and, and that was just a great lead in it's like well you know Wednesday's good um, Saturday's fun too, you know. Why don't you just come and worship at our church on Saturday and the children and have Sabbath school and <laughs> you know? But it does go to show that there's a Holy Spirit working and a convicting that you know they, they may not quite have it right as is here in Hebrews, but they're beginning to see the edges of that. That boy, there there is more to be a Sabbath rest than just the calendar date so that that was encouraging so we're hoping this summer we can um pursue that a little more amen yes you know when you think about cain and abel they both had a sacrifice Mm -hmm. 
and one felt that his sacrifice came thought his sacrifice was sufficient the one of his cho choosing but he wasn't going with sacrificing what god asked and that's really the difference between saturday and sunday sunday is man's idea tradition but god specified that that's not that's like cain offering right. his his sacrifice that's his man's idea versus what god has specified and why he made the sabbath holy he declared it holy many times in creation we see it we see it in the ten commandments he hallowed the seventh day and um we're seeing it in the new testament we see that the the disciples the apostles kept sabbath mm -hmm. um, and, and God even spoke of a, a, a redemptive act too when he, you know, when he talked about, you know, the Israelite people themselves, that, that they were looking at it as uh, he is the one who had brought them out of the house of bondage. So that redemption uh, became an aspect you know, uh, it, it, of it too. It comes between man's way or God's way, righteousness by works or righteousness by faith. And even though Adventists have been accused of being works oriented, it's actually the opposite. Because when you're worshiping on a day that man has made for tradition, that's a works. Versus by faith, what God has said, we're going to believe God and we're going to honor God with what he has chosen. That's walking by faith. And that's part of entering into the rest. First Samuel 15 tells us that the highest form of worship is, is, is obedience. I mean, that's, that's why you bow down and worship is because you're submitting to the rightful dominion and rule of God. That's and, right. You know, oh. singing and preaching and, and, and everything else is all, you know, almost secondary to the fact that of having obedience in your heart to God is how you worship God. And if he said, the seventh day is my day, then, and worship me on that day, well then you, you can't possibly truly worship him on any other day. No. Because he said, this is my day of worship. And That's right. true, obe true worship is obedience to what God says. That's know, right. In inherently. And so you mm -hmm. can't, you can't yeah. separate those can't by, separate. you know. And, and he also, to keep the Sabbath holy, Revelation 15, 4 says the only thing in the entire universe that's holy is God. And so it's only if you're with God in his presence can you possibly ever keep the Sabbath holy or yourself be holy can't do it without him and his yeah. presence is specially available only on one day and that's the seventh day yes in mm -hmm. order to keep it holy he makes his presence specially available in a way that it's not other days yeah, so, um, if we can have god's presence and we can live in his presence at all times he still somehow makes his presence specially available on the sabbath day mm -hmm. I Michelle, were you saying something? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm curious about the flip side of that question. Like, what what's allowable if we want to reach people? Uh, can we uh, go to a Bible study? Can we go to, of a Sunday keeper or of a Wednesday night group? Or um, do we have to stay away from all of that so that we don't condone their Sunday activities? No, I think um, that um, Christ walked with everybody, right? He walked with sinners and prostitutes and um, and tax collectors, the 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 drunkards, the most abhorrent um, of society. And these brothers and sisters are not; they are blessing to our society as we try to be. So, no, I I think that you know going to you know, but clearly letting people know who you are, but going to church on Sunday because someone invited you 
is no kind of violation. As a matter of fact, it's kind of funny because um, a friend of mine from a different church, the Sunday keeping church, has a men's group on Thursday nights. And I was actually considering going there tonight to spend some time with them and to get to know some folks. No, I think um, any opportunities that you have to share the character of God um, as, you know, as best you can is uh, should be taken advantage of. Yeah, I don't con- condoning. I mean, I, I think, I think that people are, people are all, we're all searching. Right. And, um, and so, yeah, we need to be a blessing wherever we can. Um, but I did want to go back to just, I don't want to completely, you know, walk over your question, Michelle, but I just wanted to go back before I forget um, to the Sabbath Sunday issue that we were talking about previously. And that was um, that um, Sabbath is also a sign like um, <clears throat> Sunday was established under man's law, you know, back when Constantine became um, became a Christian. Um, he made had a mandate. He made he passed a law that everyone needed to keep Sunday, and then he enforced that law by punishment. And the Sabbath God gave with all the signs that go with it, but He gave it and gave us freedom to choose whether to accept it or whether to keep it if you will, or not. And I think there's a, there's a big, there's, there's a lesson to be learned there that God is not a God of force and of punishment. If we don't oblige him, he's a God that gives us truth in love and then gives us freedom to choose. And I think that's one of the things that Sabbath also, as well as what everyone else has been saying, Um, symbolizes versus Sunday, which is a man's law, and then it is enforced. But anyway, did anyone else have anything to say about what Michelle had said? Yeah, I I had the thought, I mean, (coughs) excuse me, what matters most is your motivation for why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, um, are you doing it because, wow, you really convicted me, Lord, that you want me to do this? Uh, that there's souls here that you can reach through me. I, I recognize I don't have, have the strength to do this, but I know with, in your strength I can go and be, be a witness for you. Um, it also, you know, to me, you know, I could go, I could go, and I have gone to a Sunday church when invited by people, but I didn't start going every week with them. I went once to kind of see what they, how they did it and just to, you know, be courteously accept their invitation and, and befriend them. But I think if you started going every week, unless you were really openly witnessing to them, you know, Paul tells us that you know, there are things that are lawful for us to do, but that we don't want to be a stumbling block to others. It, you know, if people saw you going to Sunday worship every week, but you didn't talk to them about Sabbath, then they would just think Sunday is the right day to worship. That's what they would learn from seeing you do that. So I think you really have to be, you know, if you're going for evangelistic purposes, you need to be doing that and not just going and worshiping like they are. I think it really matters because people see what you're doing and and will make even people you don't realize are watching what you're doing and will be developing, you know, their conception of God and worship based on what you're doing. But as long as um, you're... But I think like a... uh, uh, Sorry. Like a Thursday night meeting... Like you're saying, I think that's fine. I just, I just think with the issue of worship, a, a specifically going to worship services on another day, you have to be, you know, really to I habitually do so is different from just doing it once, you know, on an occasion. 
Yeah, I, um, I used to worship with these folks down here in East Randolph pretty much every Sunday for a while. And um, they, it was very clear, though, you know, and I made it clear that I was a Seventh-day Adventist and I worshiped on Sabbath. But Amen. they welcomed me into their group. And um, and on the, in their men's, this men's study I have attended in the past. And um, they were open to um, to the things that God had asked me to share with them, you know, the things that were on my heart. And so I think it's more of the seeds that we're planting and not um, which day it is, as long as they know who you are and why you're doing right. it. But, it's, but you're also leaving yourself um, open, right, to, to questions and, to, you know, um, it's, it's wonderful, you know, and you're building relationships and that's all Christ did, right? He, he went about um, doing good. And I believe that that's what we're doing. Um, that's what, you know, I thought that at the time I was being called to do was to share what God had shared with me. <clears throat> and so I, I, I don't think personally, I don't think that there's a right and a wrong unless like you said, Craig, your intentions are not good your intentions mm -hmm. are to go there and steal sheep which i don't think is good um but to plant seeds and to get people asking themselves questions um personally i think the sabbath um, um the jews had the sabbath the jews they kept the sabbath to the best of their ability and they crucified their say our savior and and got him off the cross so that they could go and keep the Sabbath. So the Sabbath can be a there's the, we can have a misunderstanding of what's going on there. And um, you know, I think we that also needs to be considered. What is the Sabbath to us? Are we keeping it because we have to, because he's gonna punish us if we don't? Or are we keeping it because it's a means about building our relationship with him and becoming more like him. Yeah, I like think the, Ezekiel tells us that the Sabbath is for our sanctification. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, that you might know that I am God who sanctifies you, I believe is what it says. Mm -hmm. Have you had the, ever heard the story? I had a pastor tell me this, this story. It's just a short one. But there's two people rocking on a porch on the Sabbath. One is keeping the Sabbath and the other one is breaking the Sabbath. <laughs> but it is. It's all about, you know, what your attitude is, where your motivation is at, you know, why you're, why you're doing what you do. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. One is you're doing it because you choose to. And the other is you're doing it because you have to. Right. Mm. I'm wondering what people um, that maybe have a different version than I do, um, especially verse eight, or maybe we want to read the one before it to lead into it, because people like to use this particular verse to mean that there's another day that we're supposed to keep. So I think we need to talk about it. Like my version said, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? So people are saying, oh, he spoke of another day. It mentions it right here. What's the other day? Must be Sunday. Must be the Lord's day. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to go back and look at the Greek, which I I had done earlier Uh I didn't know we were going to study this tonight, so I've done this months ago. But when I look at the Greek, it says, instead of for what I'm reading here, it says something more like, because Jesus rested himself, he rested. And it's uncertain if that he spoke of a different day. Now, still, that doesn't make sense to me, but maybe somebody else has a different rendering of that. But yet verse 9 
you know, just continues. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Well, and some people can say, well, the people of God are those that worship on Sunday. Uh Okay, so. Some of those other versions actually make it seem even more, you know. You know, we have, you know, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I so, noticed so. that they twisted what the actual Greek was from what I yes. did speak versus what's in here. They added words that weren't there at all. And this yeah. is a King James version. That's That's kind of why I liked the Sabbath as being representative of God's character in the way that I tried to present it here a few minutes ago, that it represents not man's law and, um, and the enforcement of it, but God's law as part of creation and then giving us freedom to choose. Well, and it's clearly talking about righteousness by faith, because in verse 10, for he that entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. In other words, ceasing from saving ourselves from our work in the same way that God at the end of um, creation week. Verse 11 says, let us therefore labor and, you know, or labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Uh, I don't remember if I shared this shared this before, but there was a book book I had. Um, it was uh, years years and years ago. I got it. It's this this author. His name was was uh, Trudeau, but he had talked he had talked about, and I was trying to find the scientific stuff that he had talked about, but could never find it. But he said he said that the body the body receives its optimum rest and healing from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Um, his name is ever, uh, yeah Gary Gary Gary, Gary Trudeau. Trudeau yeah 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 so he was help, actually he was help. he was actually not a Christian either I'm sorry I keep walking over you Don but, no, no, um, that's fine. yeah he was not a, he was not a Christian either hmm. well have you heard of the naturalist who was studying the animals and noticed that even the animals slowed down on sabbath and the beavers were not hardly working at all Hmm. that he was noticing that something happened different on the seventh day he wasn't a christian Hmm. amen so um so as we you know we go into that 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 verse you know that verse 11 uh goes of course leads into verse 12 it says for the word of god is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piece piercing even to the dividing asunder um and then verse 13 um you know just talks about you know the, the the power of god's word how it how it you know how it just can um can pierce and can penetrate can penetrate and give us Give us the understanding, um, you know, because this this is these these scriptures, you know, like you know, there are these contrasts about about rest. You know, the, the people who who truly believe, you know, or, and a lot are sincere that believe that Sunday is is that. But God's word, God's word will penetrate and, and give understanding um, to the true seeker. Mm. And then from this rest, right, this rest and this understanding of truth, he, um, Paul end, ends it here in 14 through 16, talking about that, that great high priest, Jesus, right, who's uh, the son of God. And he's telling us to, to, to hold fast to our profession. So he's, you know, he's encouraging us to lay hold of this truth, this truth of entering into his rest, this truth of he who is the creator. And I love that so much that uh, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Mm. And, and that word grace just to me means so much. Anyone from the East, anyone from uh, the Randolph church knows um, 
my 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 definition of the word grace is um, the uh, divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. So it's that gift, that divine yeah. influence, and then the power so that it can be reflected in your life. And, and that, that is what we need. That, this that, is what we've been talking about. This is that conversion experience. That was a great definition, Brian. Mm -hmm. I found it in uh, Strong's. <laughs> you know, getting back to verse 8, um, the Greek doesn't even use the word another day. It's just very misleading what they have in here. The Greek instead of the word another, has one day or, um, you know, it has different words you can choose. So nobody knows exactly, you know, what the intention was, but they put in the assumption that the word is another day when the Greek doesn't even have that word, you know. It's possible, but it's not definitive at all. Hmm. Just it's another example of people bringing their bias to um, the interpretation of scripture rather than if there's a question, I like to go back and look at the original. You can almost read it almost as like a question too. Then mm -hmm. would not, not he afterward have spoken of another day? Yeah, but he didn't, but he didn't. Therefore, there remaineth the rest to the people of God. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, because the punctuation wasn't there either. The way today, mm -hmm. that's also from the translators. Yeah, and not not necessarily inspired. I saw that too. I I saw it in my own translation. I had a question mark. Why would he spoke of another day when he already made it clear? Yeah. <clears throat> that's to me what the true interpretation is. It's saying, why would he, why would anyone think there's another day when he made it clear that there was this day, the seventh day? Yes, and he didn't speak of another well, day. <laughs> no, there, that's not what it was saying at all. And yet that little verse, that little few words is taken out of context with the whole weight of the scripture being on this, the seventh day being the Sabbath. Mm. I think the word bias might be a little strong, or at least in my interpretation of it. You know, we all we all go through a learning process, and we all we all you know gain knowledge based on what's been taught us, and what's been taught is typically has been taught people before them, and and it's hard to break out of of those um, structures. And especially if, if you, you've been living it, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, what is gravity? You know, is, is gravity a force that pulls things to the center of the earth? Or is gravity a force that is pushed from the atmosphere that pushes things down from out to keep it from going into outer space? Um, you know, we would without doubt say, oh, no, it's from the center of the earth. It pulls things down. But we don't know that. But that's the statement we would make just because that's what we've lived with. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Bias kind of to me sounds like that they kind of knew maybe they had a chance. They had other options that they could review. But no, I they wanted to go their way and, and not somebody else's way. That's just probably the way I look at it. But. I, I understand what you're saying, um, but I think it's a, it would be a lot of this is maybe unintended bias. It's it's their relationship. Yeah, of course, yeah. No, it was that not, particular time. You know. Totally unintended. I I don't think there was any malice going on here. I just think that you know the good men who put this together, just like us, have our biases and That's did the right. best they could. But I think you're right that people do take this and try to, um, you know, make their belief uh, say something that... And, and, pretty, 
And, and pretty much every single one of the translators who have translated any copy of any Bible in, in any modern language, almost all of them had no correct understanding of the seventh day Sabbath and believed that there was another day. Right. So that bias of interpretation was, you know, kind of built into the translators' mindset. That, yeah, that's just kind of their existence. They, that was just how yeah. they knew it. Yes. They, they weren't trying to see an interpretation that was saying that the seventh day remained. <laughs> right. Daniel. <laughs> Even though that's really what the passage says. <laughs> time of the end. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's just Satan, like, Satan especially inspires that because he hates God's law. Well, it's just like the comma that we see when Christ says to the thief on the cross, you know, today you will be with me in paradise rather than I say to you today, comma, you'll be with me in paradise. So they decided where the comma goes based on, you know, what they believed to be the state of the dead. And I see this in a similar fashion. Yeah. Amen. I see the same in certain really important prophetic passages. If the translators had no conception of what that prophecy was really about, they they mm -hmm. often when given, you know, you know, a lot of these words in the original language have many different meanings and they're they're searching for one that seemed to make the most sense in the passage as they understood the, the gospel That's and right. the scriptures. But if they really didn't understand what it was really saying, then that could lead them to pick the wrong word. Or, and, and as we've seen from our studies, you know, together and especially with Pastor Tim, you know, there often more than one meaning can apply. Mm -hmm. It is not yes. necessarily just one correct way to translate it. God, you know, mm -hmm. intended these double meanings often. Mm -hmm. Do you all see, you know, verses 14, 15, and 16? Do you look like, don't those look like they're more for chapter 5? <laughs> they seem like, they, seem like they, they fit more with chapter 5 than they do with chapter 4. You know, he's talking about the entering into rest, but then he goes into this 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 high priestly ministry, which, which there is a transition, seeing then that we have this great high priest. You yes. know, he talks about, but it just seems like it's it's connected more to more to chapter five, um, more of a lead in for five, I guess. But but it's and still that, wonderful. I agree that's a better a better break. That mm. same thing happens at the end of chapter five too. Oh. Versus 11 through 13, 14 should probably be the beginning of chapter 6, because, again, that goes into what well, my Bible actually has a, a heading, a warning against apostasy mm. that begins with verse 11. Hmm. Interesting. It does seem to flow better with the next chapter. Yeah, yeah, you know. But again, it may be in our understanding that may be different um, than kind of what they were thinking of a high priest was at that time, too. Um, and I don't know, I mean, maybe they're looking on the other side of the picture. We're looking conceptual and we're How does looking it work? linear. How does it work chiastically? Pastor had several times mentioned that um, the end of um, one chapter is sometimes like an introduction to the next. Right. Um, if I remember what he had said correctly. <clears throat> In Hebrews, th this book of Hebrews just seems to be like one, it could be, you could probably take all those headings out and it could probably be just one big sermon. The way it, it could, but you can see being a format, you know, mm. if you were to put it up on a PowerPoint screen and do one big sermon, you, you know, you, you would, you would hit the highlights of chapter one and then you would move into the highlights of chapter two. So there is a progression that takes place as he, he goes down through defining 
who Christ is. And now that he's our mm-hmm. high priest, he's laid the groundwork to why he's qualified to be our mm-hmm. high priest. You know, yeah. Melchizedek was a high priest just because, you know, he was. Um, but but here, this is, uh, he's, he's not your average everyday high priest. So he's, he's led that, laid that groundwork. Yeah, verse verse fifteen spells that out quite clearly that he's yeah he's not yeah well he he was a type right that looked yeah. forward to the to the to the true Christ yes <clears throat> yes um, getting back to Hebrews as a book I had heard it um, as uh, presented to me as as it was a sermon mm. so if you read it it's it's like a sermon. There's, there's one, wherefores, one complete- therefores, there's seeing that, you know, it seems like there's a lot of these transition points into it. Right. You know, I present this, but wherefore, and then you present that, and then it's therefore. So it's like there's a building up upon everything, just, just building up, building up. Yeah. A uh, series of, of linking thoughts, right? Yeah. It seems <clears throat> to- cool, though. And it's really, you know, it's... A- it's evangelizing the the Jews or the Hebrews or mm-hmm. or trying to solidify the Jewish converts in really clearly seeing Christ as the antitype of the whole Jewish economy of mm-hmm. the whole sacrificial mm-hmm. system and the feast system and really tying it all together in mm-hmm. in one message. Mm-hmm. And then, well, it had to be pretty mind blowing to read it then, just as it can be now. Well, Amazing. just thinking, thinking of their mindset, the Jewish mindset at that time, and this just kind of blew everything out of the water because they believed that there was actually salvation in the ritual, mm-hmm. well, as do some religions today right yeah. but it was all for the many, learning many adventists mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well yes yes haven't we haven't we haven't i tried to address that this evening um yeah. we're not Absolutely. saved by our works that's right we're not saved because mm-hmm. we're keeping the sabbath we're keeping the sabbath because right. we're saved right <laughs> um but, uh, but, but right, as you said, we believe that we are saved through the ritual, but it's not. It's, it's about the education that these symbols are trying to supply to us. It's, it's lessons learned. It's transformation of our mind. But, but I go to church on Saturday and I don't eat pork. What do you mean I'm not saved? Yeah. So so did so did the Jews, right? The Jews paid tithe. Right. They did they they had a health message. They kept that special mm-hmm. day. They they did all kinds of things, right? All in um all in in a great uh, vigor and uh, enthusiasm to uh, uplift uplift God, right? Yeah. Or was it to and uplift they claimed himself? to be the the preservers of the law. That's right. They they were the keepers of the law. God gave it to them. I think of James where it says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. That doesn't mean we're saved by works, but it's a good point, too. Oh, absolutely. So works are going to follow our faith. It's the fruit in this being grafted in this book, to that Hebrews is, in, 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 in righteousness by faith is just infused throughout Hebrews. Amen. Faith in, in Christ, in his being everything, and his power to, to redeem and to save being total. That he is righteous. He is holy. He is the priest. He is the king. He is the creator. He is everything. And look at all these people in history who had faith in him. And do the same. Yeah. 
It's... He's the one that sanctifies. Yes. I quoted okay. this before, but the essence of all righteousness is, is loyalty to our Redeemer. Is what Mrs. White said. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. What does that mean, loyalty? Yeah, it's obedience. Yeah. When you're a loyal, Our, when you're loyal to someone, I, when I'm loyal to my, my boss, my boss is going to tell me to do this and I'm going to do that. And you do this and I'm going to do that. Love but your that's neighbor because of yourself. Our, that's because of our, yeah, that's because of a, a relationship that, that we've, we've, we've built upon. Trust that I have, you know, and in, in, in what, you know, in the good that she's going to have for for us and, and the people that we work with, you know, so there's, yeah, it's an understanding. And as a result of that, I, I work, work for it. And it's fruit. And for us, it's, 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 you know, it's abiding in Christ and that's what bears, bears fruit. And those works are really the out, that's the out, outworking what, of what Christ is doing in us. Christ needs to be our Lord and Savior, not just our Savior, but our yeah. Lord. Yeah. Yes. That's right. <clears throat> and since he's the king, and he's the king of not only this earth, but the universe, we need to do what the king says. Yes. And, and Paul is really saying here, especially in... in chapters three and four he's he's saying you you can have the the symbol or the ritual but without the substance it's meaningless mm -hmm. it's yes. worthless that's right yeah well, like when saul had uh didn't do the job that god had asked him to do and samuel says what's the bleeding of the sheep that i hear and saul made excuse well you know i I saved them for sacrifice. And what did Samuel say to him? Obedience, Obedience is better than sacrifice. Mm. Sacrifice is a form of worship. So obedience is a higher form of worship. It's almost 30, folks. Oops. You got something you want to say, Brian? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think I'm going to bow out. Oh, well, before you do, before you do, you mind having a closing prayer for us? I, I do not mind having a closing prayer. Amen. Let's bow before our God, dear Heavenly Father. We are so thankful that you are giving us clearer revelations of who you are so that we might be converted, that our minds might be changed, that we might not be fearful servants, but loving and obeying out of love and not out of um, works, as it were. So, Father, we ask, we thank you for the amazing sacrifice that you made for us, for the remedy that you're providing for us. Father, please make it clear to us how we can partake of that, how we can be transformed, and how we can love, love in the face of anything. Father, we thank you because we know you love us and we know you will do this thing through the power of your spirit and through, and through Jesus' name. We thank you. Amen. Amen.